so much for coming out on another balmy Vermont evening. Uh, you were probably out on your stroll through the village and just decided to drop in. So we're really glad to have you here. And um, you know, it's, it's a wonderful evening to be able to actually have not only the graduate students here, but also the undergrads and various members from our community who've been brave enough to get out and about and come join us. Um, it's always a highlight of, of my year and, and Robin Curry's as well here as we pull people together uh, for a conversation that, as you will see here soon, is not a simplistic one by any means. We're very fortunate tonight to be able to welcome Natasha Bowens as our visiting scholar for the MSFS program. And um, I'd just like to say a few words about that. First of all, um, some of you may have run into Natasha. We have a really fantastic collaboration with NOVA Vermont that we've done every year at the MSFS. Um, the theme this year was growing the good food movement, and Natasha was the keynote speaker to kick that whole thing off, and she rocked. And she'll rock again tonight as well. Um, so it's been a wonderful collaboration there. Um, just a, a couple of reflections to kind of introduce uh, Natasha and the context of having her here. You know, there's been a tremendous growth over the last two decades. Um, not only in sustainable agriculture and then what has um, become the emerging discipline of the sustainable food systems, um, but as that's happened, we've also been reminded and kind of pushed and prodded in different ways of what's sometimes been overlooked in our focus on all things green. And, you know, it's really, there's been a question, and it's been a question here for those of us here at GMC in many ways over the past two decades, is it really about the shades of green, or is it green as the background and context for a spectrum of issues and perspectives? It's something we really struggled with quite a bit here. Years ago, those of us um, who were involved in the early stages of the environmental liberal arts and the push for sustainability here at the college, you know, we did wonder aloud, believe it or not, it's not that we were all that insightful, but we wondered about the fact whether the green world that we were creating here at GMC you know, was really going to be diverse enough in the long run? Where are we niching ourselves? Where are we closing ourselves off to the rest of the world in some interesting ways? None of us wanted a black and white world. We were very clear on that. In fact, we found our students were coming in with some black and white visions that we had to push back against in some ways. And some days we said we were arguing, arguing for shades of gray, and other days we said we were really trying to provide a much more technicolor vision of the world around us as we were doing that. But we were really struggling with whether green was going to describe the world that we were really looking for. So as we're so fortunate to have Natasha here with us um, tonight, she, and, and not only tonight, but also this week, she really is bringing two gifts to us. You know, the first of those gifts is the reminders of the potential and the pitfalls of movement in any singular form. The second is the importance of vision and determination in doing truly groundbreaking research. And that doesn't always happen within the academy. And that's something we also need to bear in mind. In some ways, what Natasha has done, and I'm going to let her tell her story to you, but she really transformed the sense of loneliness and uncertainty as a brown girl farming into a kaleidoscope of community, woven together through the gifts of narrative and imagery. The color of food is the best kind of research, in my view. It's inspired, and it's independent, it's deep listening, and then ultimately what it becomes is unbounded curated sharing. It's most intimidating in peer-reviewed uh, forums, I would say. But it's most intimidating in being peer-reviewed among the really being tested by marginalized communities. And whether there, and those are places where there's very little room for error. So you need to get it right when you actually go out. You do the research, you do the analysis, you try to tell the stories of others. You know, it's much easier to do that in certain realms. It's much, much harder when you're trying to represent people who have too little voice, or in some cases, no voice. And misrepresentation can be just as disastrous as no representation, if not more. So we really get tonight to share in the story. You get to see the seed of an idea um, that is now, six years later, not just a, a seed, but a diaspora, the casting of, that, of those seeds. And our task tonight, I think, and throughout this week, is to cultivate the questions in a rich and a colorful light. So welcome, Natasha. Thanks for being here.
Um, that was a beautiful introduction. Thank you, Philip. And it's just been beautiful to meet Philip and the entire Green Mountain College community. You guys have been warmly welcoming me um, ever since I stepped foot in Vermont, <laughs> even though it wasn't very warm outside. Um, I felt really warm from, from this community. Um, so I have to apologize to those who were at NOFA because the first little part of this presentation is going to feel like deja vu, especially because I think I was also wearing this scarf on Saturday. So, <laughs> I'm really sorry. But I promise it will only be this little intro to give some of our other guests a little background into, uh, into what, I'm, what I'm talking about. Um, and then we're going to get a little interactive, and I have some student volunteers that are going to help bring some voices into the room, so um, get ready for that. Um, so, how many folks here are a part of the food movement? Who eats food? <coughs> All right, right? <laughs> Who cares about food? All right, so all of us in this room, whether we realize it or not, and for whatever reason we are interested in food, we care about food, whether we grow food or we just eat it or we're pushing to change the food system, we are, without a doubt, a part of this large, incredible movement that is sweeping the nation right now. And it feels really good to be a part of something like that. Um, all of us in our own ways, in our own cor corners of the country, are creating change, right? We're changing mindsets, we're changing practices, we're changing the food system. We're changing the soil right beneath our feet. That's pretty powerful. Am I right? <laughs> That's really powerful stuff. Um, and so no wonder, especially with the master's students here, the masters in food sustainable, sustainable food systems, no wonder we are figuring out ways and trying to come up with ways how we can keep building on this power, keep pushing that change, keep growing our movement. But why I'm here, and why I'm invited to a lot of these spaces, is to kind of tell the movement, let's all just pause, <coughs> sit. I know these issues are urgent. We're trying to make so much change so fast. But let's pause and zoom out and take a look at our movement. Take a look at our growth, right? We want to keep growing. Not necessarily in size, but in effectiveness and in integrity. We should really be looking at ourselves in the mirror and figuring out maybe if there's some areas where we can learn, change, and grow. And I mentioned integrity, and what does that make us think about, right? Maybe a movement that is not for just good food, but a movement for good, trying to do good things. And maybe good makes you think about just and fair, hopefully. You know, whether our food is grown, how our food is grown, whether it's just and fair, how our food workers are treated, how the land is treated, and whether all the communities that need it are getting that food. These are all pieces of the very complex puzzle of the food movement that are sitting right there on our plates if we dare to follow our food back. But just how far back are we willing to follow our food? How deep are we willing to dig? Because fair and just might also bring up issues like farm worker rights, food justice, food access in communities of color and low-income communities. But that's just scratching the surface. And those issues don't define the communities they exist in. Right? The role of people of color isn't just to stand in line at food banks, get food stamps, or harvest our food. <clears throat> right? It's pretty insulting. They, they play other roles in this movement. You know, what is the agrarian, agrarian identity? What are the identities and roles in this food movement for communities of color? Um, so it's about you know hanging out. We're just hanging out in the topsoil if we think that uh, just talking about farm worker rights and food justice or or campaigning to to get an extra penny per pound to address farm worker wages or dropping off our extra produce at the local food bank 
is just solving the issue. We're not digging down deep enough, down to the bottom roots, all the way down to the bedrock where the real complexities of these issues lie and where we can really start to see those complexities and really start to understand what's going on in these communities, the historical and political and cultural and racial threads that are attached to our food and to these communities. So if we really want to grow as a movement and we really want to be a powerful, wiser, stronger, more inclusive movement, we've, we've got to do some digging. And when I started farming six years ago and joined this movement, um, and I'll get to that story in a second, but when I became a part of this movement, it really didn't take me long to see just how badly it needed to do some digging. Looking at the glaring, glaring inequities in the food system and the inequities that were a result even of the good food movement is what ultimately caused me to go out on this life-changing journey. It caused me to put down my shovel and pick up my pen and my tape recorder and just listen. Because I thought if I'm not hearing, if we're not hearing as a movement from the communities marginalized by the food system, the very same communities that are the most heavily impacted by our broken system, if we're not hearing their voices, we're not hearing anything. If we truly want to be an inclusive movement, you know, a technicolor movement, as, as Philip said, and if we if we want to be if we want to do good and we want to be sustainable, which means we want to be around for good, then we've really got to have everyone at the table. And if they're not at the table, we've got to find out why. And I mentioned in the earlier dialogue, sometimes that might mean going and knocking at their doors and asking to sit and listen at their tables, right? Hearing some of these overlooked, very complex stories that come with rich information that can help us really start to understand all the issues tied to our food system and help us really build relationships and slowly build this stronger, better movement. So that's why I'm here today, to bring some of these stories into the room. I am author of this book, The Color of Food, Stories of Race, Resilience, and Farming. And it's a book that focuses on stories from farmers and food activists of color, specifically farmers and food activists from black, Latina, native, and Asian communities, which are very vast and complex communities within themselves. And through storytelling and portraits, um, this, their stories give us insight into some of the issues that they see going on in the system and the food movement, into some of the barriers they see. But it also highlights the work that they've been doing often well before this national movement has taken hold. Sustainable farming practices and work that has, may have been overlooked by the larger movement, but that has been vital in their own communities. These stories take us a little bit into the history of injustice and inequities for communities of color as a whole, talking about land loss. But also, these stories highlight the resilience of many of these communities and how they're still here and they're still doing what they've always been doing, creating change and pushing forward creating revolutionary change. And it's all happening around far, uh, food and farming. Finally, their stories remind us of the diversity of culture that lives in our food and reminds us that without culture, there is no agriculture. So I want to share some of the stories from my book and um, with the lens that Philip and Green Mountain has, have invited me for this residency. <laughs> Um, I will focus more on urban agriculture and food justice issues, although my book is not focused solely on that. Actually, most of the stories in this book come from rural farmers, and it's more about that agrar agrarian identity, um, although there are definitely stories touching on food justice and urban agriculture and many, many other things. But um, So tonight will be a little different with the stories, but, but before we get into the stories, <coughs> I'll share a little bit of my own story. 
um, so that you can understand how I came and how I came to be a visiting scholar, first of all, this fancy title, even the title of author I'm still getting used to. Um, how I came to be up here in front of all of you because I'm not a public speaker. I am, um, I am not an academic. I don't work for an organization. You know, this project was not research mandated by some Food Justice Policy Council or the Diversity Department within the USDA. Although, and sorry, no, for people, I'm going to make my joke again. I do feel like it should be mandated that they all read it. They're the USDA. Um, I am not a student. I haven't been one in 10 years. So this isn't my. This wasn't my uh, thesis research project. This project simply came out of my own, my own experience, and Philip touched on it, my own experience as a woman of color joining this movement and feeling a little alone, and feeling a little frustrated with what I saw was a misrepresentation of uh, agriculture and, and, and healthy food um, in this country. Um, so it just kind of started as a modest storytelling and photography uh, multimedia project that I had no idea what I was doing. Um, you know, staying up late, at night in, in my room up in upstate New York where I was farming at the time, this was six years ago. I was trying to put all the pieces in place to get this project off the ground. Um, I didn't know what I was doing, I had no money, but I had an incredible community behind me because at that point I had fallen into um, a community in New York, uh, a POC, people of color led uh, movement in New York and um, I had this great community behind me and they encouraged me to do some fundraising. So I logged on to one of these Kickstarter websites, and uh, after 60 days, I raised $10,000. And then I got a matching grant after that. So that, to me, was overwhelming affirmation that this wasn't just a personal, personal digging project for me and all the questions I have. This was affecting so many people. And as I saw that impact, uh, the project just, just grew. So I then found myself out on the road in my 1990 Oldsmobile station wagon named Lucy. All right, all right, she, she died. <laughs> but she got me around and she was amazing. Um, so here I am on the road um, during the hottest summer on record in 2012, driving from farm to farm with my camera, my tape recorder, and my notebook by my side at the ready. I had spent uh, two years, so from 2010 to 2012, developing relationships with farmers and different organizations and doing outreach and getting, um, getting folks who agreed to be interviewed. And now I was ready, or so I thought, for this life-changing journey. And uh, like I said, this project started for very personal reasons, and I feel like this quote by Alice Walker, I'm not sure if you can see that, really sums it up. In search of my mother's garden, I found my own. Now, I'm a mixed kid, and my racially ambiguous skin tone has been confusing Americans since 1983, so I'll put it out there. <laughs> I am a mixed kid, biracial, black and white, uh, raised by a white mother. And so I always felt like, figuratively speaking, I was always trying to find my own garden, trying to find my place as a brown girl um, in my mother's garden in white America, right? And when I started farming, and I joined this super crunchy, majority white movement for organic food and farming and gardening. That was just emphasized even more. And so I was looking for my own garden, and this project really helped me, helped me find that. Um, so, but before I found that, I was in someone else's garden. I was, um, found myself barefoot in the mud on an organic farm in West Virginia at a hippie commune, and I was looking around wondering what the hell I was doing. <coughs> I was looking around wondering where all the other brown folk were, right? And maybe I was in the wrong place in West Virginia in this hippie commune. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, I was loving that I was finally fulfilling my dream. I had been in DC for two years working as a healthcare and environmental policy um, advocate, and suddenly the lights had gone off, right? All the issues I was so passionate about, changing the environment, addressing health care, social justice issues, food was at the center of all of it, right? It was the elephant in the room uh, that 
nobody at my organization was talking about. So I just started immersing myself in, in this food movement. I started growing my own food in my little backyard. I started going to farmers markets. I started going to conferences, reading books, volunteering on community gardens, and going out. Finally, I left my job and, and, and found this farm. Um, and it was great, but in all of those spaces, I couldn't ignore the exclusiveness of the movement, right? I, could, I, I felt like I wasn't represented in the picture that this movement painted, which was this, right? <laughs> Organic, fresh foods, farmer's market, back to the land. Um, this was everywhere. I was looking. All the all the magazines, um, you know, all the all the hipsters that were coming out. Um, America's best young farmers. Wait, I'm I'm a young farmer, you know. Uh, this one is cultivating the capital food shed. That's my food shed. D.C. the capital. Young farmers. That's me. I'm I'm already calling myself a young farmer, even though I just started farming. But <laughs> where am I? Right. They call D.C. the chocolate city. What's going on? <laughs> okay. And, and at this time, even in D.C., the chocolate city, you know, community gardens were popping up. Um, like I said, the conferences I was going to, food justice conferences, um, farmers markets, opening up in low-income and communities of color to address these issues. But the folks that were leading the discussions, the folks that were uh, staffing the farmers markets, um, the folks that were starting these urban gardens were not from those communities, right? The farmers markets, um, they would be in predominantly Spanish-speaking neighborhoods sometimes without any bilingual staff, no culturally relevant foods. Um, and the, the folks running the community gardens were wondering why they were having problems getting the folks to come to the garden, right? Getting, getting volunteers out. Um, and any exception to this, right, because there were some community-led uh, programs and, and, and gardens, but they weren't getting as much visibility. They weren't getting as much funding. They weren't getting as much support. And that's kind of the piece that we're going to delve into tonight, um, specifically with urban agriculture and, and um, whether we're being represented, not just in the picture, because some folks might say, okay, well, that's just a picture. Who cares if we're not being represented in the media? But if we're being left out of the literal picture, what else are we being left out of? Are the best farmers markets opening up in communities of color? Whole Foods, are they coming? Mom's Market, again, grocery stores, right? And, and are we being left out of, are we at the table pushing this movement forward? Are we being left out of the leadership and decision making that's going on in these communities? These panel discussions about food insecurity in the very communities, are those people being represented? So I'm going to steal my iPad from y'all and switch. Bear with me so I don't normally, uh, I kind of am melding two different videos and two different presentations together. So I appreciate your patience. But um, so food justice, right? We're not really going to, <coughs> this isn't a presentation about what food justice is. to talk about what food justice is. You guys are studying the food system. Um, I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with what food just justice issues are. Um, we're going to talk about our, the movement's approaches to solving food justice issues. Um, see, this is what I get for trying to be creative here. <laughs> There we go. We figured it out. Alrighty. Okay, so that gave you a sneak peek. I'm not there, but we 
we've got it up. Um, so, yes, we're going to talk about how we are approaching food justice issues as a, as a movement. Is it sustainable? Okay, what does sustainability mean? Sustainability on many levels. Truly sustainable in farming, what does that mean? We're using our resources, skills, and knowledge in a way that is beneficial to the ecosystem, including ourselves as farmers and eaters, right? It's sustainable because it's lasting. The land can keep resiliently regenerating itself. It is regenerative farming. Well, when we talk about sustainability of our movement, people studying to change the food system, where are we putting our resources? <clears throat> Our, our, our all, all skills, knowledge, and experiences at the table. Meaning our all communities' voices at the table. And not in a way that is tokenism, just come sit at my table, but I'm not going to actually listen to what you have to say, right? But truly contributing, leading. Because when we talk about food justice and the good food movement as a whole, and I don't want to pigeonhole it just for the food, food justice movement and let people off the hook here because all the facets of our food system and good food movement impact all communities. And the flaws in the system and in the movement disproportionately impact the communities most often labeled as food deserts and targeted for food justice work. But are these communities being turned to for the answers? Are they being recognized as leaders in the movement and if not, is the larger movement of food justice work regenerative? Here is what regenerative means. It might be hard to read. The process of renewal, restoration, and growth that makes ecosystems or communities resilient to natural fluctuations or events that cause disturbance or damage. I'll let that sit with you guys for a second. This is what I call sustainability. Are we regenerating, right? And if the work is being done from the outside in, when we talk about food justice, food justice issues, is that really a process that really regenerates growth and resilience in our communities? These kinds of questions are really what drive my work and the book and the sharing of these stories. So, as I said, tonight's a little interactive. It's a little different, and we're going to jump into that now. Um, I'm going to bring some voices into the room of uh, food justice advocates. And um, I don't want to say urban, because not all the communities are technically urban, but maybe labeled as food deserts, because it's not just urban that can be labeled as well. And I'm going to do that with the help of my volunteers. So, Caesar. I grew up in the midst of social, economic, and environmental devastation created by the expo explosion of the maquiladora, or, or sweatshop industry. That, among other consequences, led both the U.S. and Mexico sides of the border town of Nogales, Arizona, to reach world records for <coughs> rates of cancer and lupus. We also witnessed the many destructive effects of the North American Free Trade Agreement and saw the border become militarized. In the midst of the context of militarization, voice and despair here on the border, or violence and despair here on the border, people have, have had to people have to figure out how to eat. For seven months of the year, 60% of the fresh produce <coughs> eaten in the U.S. is grown in Mexico and transported directly through the borderlands here. People here on both sides of the border go hungry. We're surrounded by farms and harvest America's food, yet our communities are considered food deserts. I actually moved to the South Bronx in 2003 when I was 23 years old and I had a three-month-old child. I was looking to find a place close to the train station so that I could get to work and to school. I was still in college and working full-time and I needed to find a place that was affordable. In the course of living here, I gained about 40 pounds. And some of it was from having children, but a lot of it was that I found myself eating McDonald's every day. And it wasn't like I didn't know any better, 
but I was very stressed out. I was a young woman with children and not a lot of money. And these places that were within walking distance, these were the places that were close to me, and they were cheap. Valerie. Though the Muckleshoot don't have a public health department doing research on the impacts of diabetes and other illnesses in our tribe, I have no doubt that the entirety of our 2,000 members is affected by diabetes. When I go to school and ask the kids to raise their hands if they have a relative that has diabetes, every one of them raises their hand. The same with cancer. It's an epidemic. These illnesses are here in our community, and they are rampant. Before Katrina, there wasn't a grocery store in the neighborhood. There hadn't been a grocery store here since the 1980s. After Katrina, half the grocery stores in New Orleans closed and never reopened. And for a while, the closest place for us to go was about four miles away, which is far when 30% of our residents don't have transportation. I worked in home health with elders, and I saw how the program was basically forcing our elders to choose between buying food or buying medicine. And that's just not right. That's not our way. In our community, when I was growing up, elders didn't lack for anything. Children didn't lack for anything. We took care of our people. But here I was watching my tribal elders needing to buy medicine and dying without food. Or dying from the food they are giving them. That crap at the food banks is killing them. This isn't the food our people are used to. Tanya. called Mothers on the Move, and I started getting involved. I started learning all of the different things that were happening here in the Bronx. The 16,000 diesel truck trips that we get every day, most of it attributed to the transportation of food, but almost none of that fresh food comes into our community. The air quality caused by those trucks contributes to my daughter's chronic asthma. There are 32 open airway transfer stations in the South Bronx alone. Then, looking at all the food options here, fast food, liquor stores, that's all we get. And I just got angry, and I wanted to direct that anger somewhere positive. Caesar. There are a lot of residents forming organizations here in Nogales and throughout the Sonoran Desert, like a woman's collective working with a few resources in the barrios and the colonias on food production, leadership, development, and health with the worst, with most vulnerable women and children. And my group, Tierra y Libertad, Libertad organization, works also with few resources on barrio health, leadership, food production, and economic development. This work is led and supported by this desert community, poor, undocumented, indigenous, young, and old. We live here every day working regular jobs, raising healthy families, and fighting without resources to put an end to the devastation of our community and health. We are building a foundation for a strong movement led by the most vulnerable and invisible. Thank you. Beverly. So a bunch of us mothers got together and decided to do something. We call ourselves American Indian Mothers and we work on health and nutrition education. We started Three Sisters Farm where we grow corn, beans, and squash the Iroquois way and we started our own canning operations where we can fresh food. We also started our own food bank for the elderly and for families that need it where we give out the foods of our people. <coughs> 
Valerie. So I decided to study nutrition with a focus on traditional foods of our ancestors. I, re I researched with Muckleshoot elders and studied the wild foods common in our tribe and the medicinal and health properties they carry. Traditional foods are also at the center of our culture as a people. We know that these foods have sustained us for a long time. They've maintained our health, and they're going to sustain us into the future as well. Having access to our foods is key. It's beyond justice, it's sovereignty. Every time I go harvest, I am expressing sovereignty. Jenga. So in 2011, a Walmart opened up in the neighboring parish. They came to solve our food desert problem for us. But that's not the kind of solution we want. It really bothers me to hear people talk about solutions to problems in neighborhoods like the Lower Ninth Ward as just a quick fix. Like, here's a store, any store, as if we'll just accept anything you give us because we're so poor. It's not that we don't appreciate the effort, but it's important that these efforts are actually supportive, instead of imposing what a few decide onto a whole community. Caesar. So I went to this panel on food justice issues here in the Sonoran Desert where I live. There were educated experts on hunger, food justice, and water harvesting. They were all from well-funded nonprofit organizations and universities, well known in the Southern Arizona food justice circles. They were all Anglo, and none of them grew up here in the Sonoran Desert. Their responses to impacting food insecurity in the borderlands were way off target. I mentioned this panel not to exclude these people as everyone has a role and we all work together towards the same goal but we need to question why this panel and so much of the recognized food justice movement has no representation from the people who can best respond to the attacks that cause so much despair in our communities who are these experts how do we support new leaders who has the power in the food justice movement tanya A few years ago, I was invited to speak at TEDx Manhattan's Changing the Way We Eat. I was excited for the platform to launch my organization, the Black Project's new mobile farmer's market and urban farm project in the South Bronx. But right before the event, I was uninvited. They claimed it was because my organization wasn't incorporated. But this just doesn't make sense, seeing as how TEDx events were supposed to be focused on individual thought leaders. And several of the speakers selected with me did not belong to any organization. I couldn't help but start comparing myself to the other speakers on the list. I would have been one of only two black speakers for that event and addressing of food issues in my city. And Jane. One thing I've been doing is having visioning meetings with the neighborhood to create a food action plan that outlines exactly what we want for our community. And we have certain standards of what we want for ourselves. The sad produce they have tried putting in the corner market looks like it belongs in the giveaway bin at Whole Foods. It's insulting. Our residents want a community-owned store, black-owned businesses, a return to the mom-and-pop shops that used to be here selling fresh quality produce, quality meats, seafood at bakeries. It's really important to us who owns the stores and that the money stays in the community. That Walmart they open next door, those tax dollars aren't <coughs> even staying in our neighborhood. We deserve to have these things, just like any other community. Thank you. Thank you so much to my volunteers. <laughs> These are all amazing food justice advocates, farmers, urban gardeners who are doing amazing work in their own communities. Cesar Lopez is one of the only one that I haven't actually met. He is a voice from Why Hunger and the Food Voices um, 
project series that they are cultivating, and I just thought his story was really perfect for tonight. Cesar Lopez is a founding collective member of Tierra y Libertad Organization and Barrio Sustainability Project in Southside Tucson, Arizona. Currently, Cesar is collaborating with White Hunger and food justice leaders Don Bustos and Alma Maquetico to develop a border region food justice collective leadership model. He is a Kellogg Community Food Fellow with Gary Navin Southwest Center at the University of Arizona. Tanya Fields is a good friend of mine. She's one of my um, mentors and just someone who was really inspiring for me when I ended up in New York. So I was upstate farming, but uh, the farmer that I did farm for lived for quite a while in the South Bronx. And so we, we um, took all of our produce to market there and we were in deep partnership with organizations like Tanya's The Black <coughs> Project and Black Girl Inc. And um, she has started her mobile um, vegetable market project. That is the bus there. I used to drive that bus um, through the Bronx, which is not an easy thing in the streets, <laughs> big bus. But we made it happen. Um, and, uh, but you know, she's still looking for funding to get this thing off the ground. They converted the bus to run on veggie oil. Um, they're trying to do things right, uh, but it, it's hard to, to keep veggie oil uh, vehicles going. Um, and it, it's hard to get these kind of initiatives off the ground. They're also starting Libertad Farm, which is an urban farm in the Bronx, but just two weeks ago she was still sending around crowdsourced to fundraising links. Um, they, they're, still, they're still fundraising, and that really did happen. She got uninvited from TEDx um, just a little bit before she was supposed to speak. This was a couple years ago, but because she's such an amazing woman, she took the opportunity um, to create her own event. Um, and she held it on the very same day that TEDx Manhattan happened. And, there, and uh, the, old, the only other black speaker that was invited to that panel was Karen Washington. And Karen Washington uh, stepped out of TEDx Manhattan and, and came to, to Tanya's <laughs> event. And it was powerful. And she's been doing it every year since. Um, she is a change maker. And Valerie Seagrest is someone who is featured in the book. Um, she is a Muckleshoot tribe member, which are Salish or Coast Salish people of the Northwest. She's based in Auburn, Washington on the Muckleshoot Reservation, and she's a native foods educator and community nutritionist. Um, so she's all about wild foods, wild medicines, harvesting food sovereignty, uh, preserving cultural foodways, and she's really um, addressing nutrition and and cultural foodways in her community. She was also a um, international agricultural trade and policy fellow, food and community fellow, a couple of years ago. Jenga Mwendo, she's in New Orleans, and she uh, started the Backyard Gardeners Network. Um, her story is also very powerful. You see I have a lot of women in here, and that's a little biased um, on my part. Um, but I also think, and I was having this conversation with someone here, that you know, although male farmers dominate the agricultural industry, I personally have seen that as far as farming for community and building community and this work that women are really leading that. Um, so I have a whole chapter in the book dedicated to the fierce farming women out there. But Jenga, she, um, she was born and raised in the Lower Ninth Ward of New Orleans, as we all know, was one of the hardest hit neighborhoods um, after Hurricane Katrina, and she wasn't living there at the time, although all her family was there. She moved to New York because she was um, an, an animation artist, and she was involved in, in creating movies. That was what she was doing. But after the hurricane hit, she wanted to go back home, and she went back home and organized a lot of help for her family and, and just throwing all the chaos, and she, she owned a home there, and she decided to move back, and she renovated her, her home. It was obviously flood line all the way up the walls, and she taught herself how to strip the house down bare, and she did her own work because you really couldn't trust a lot of the contractors at that time uh, in this community after the hurricane. Um, but she found that it wasn't so easy for a lot of the rest of the neighborhood to return. I think the number was around 75% of the Lower Ninth Ward had left after, after the hurricane. And, um, I mean, huge, huge numbers, I might be wrong on that exact statistic, but they weren't coming back and she wanted to figure out what people needed to come back and the folks that were there, what they needed to just bring the community alive again. And uh, there used to be some community gardens and so she helped kind of uh, revive those 
And what Jenga says is community gardening, it's not about the food. They're not trying to become the next urban farm. It's about building community and creating spaces. And also, with the gentrification that New Orleans is seeing, particularly in her neighborhood, and with this urban agricultural movement pushing gentrification, she wanted to claim the neighborhood, right, for the residents that have been there. Uh, the Lower Ninth Ward, um, many people may not know, had one of the highest black ownership rates in all of New Orleans and in, all of, in a lot of cities in the country, I'm pretty sure. So um, there was strong pride there in her neighborhood and she, she started a campaign that was called the Garden Walk and it was about getting the seniors out and it was about going and visiting the gardens, but she was also very clear to say that it was about walking the streets and letting folks know this, these were our streets um, and this is our neighborhood. Um, and she's doing fantastic work there. Next we have Beverly Collins Hall, another fierce woman. Um, she is Tuscarora, Cherokee, and Iroquois, and she's based in Robinson County, North Carolina, which is one of the poorest counties in the country. 40% um, Native American uh, makes up that county, mostly Lumbee people, but there's also a mix. Um, and, uh, you know, as you've heard her say, she started American Indian Mothers about 12 years ago um, because of her experience in home health and what she was seeing. And then they also started the Three Sisters Farm. And now they're starting a canning operation. They started their own food bank where they're giving out the foods from the farm, uh, culturally relevant foods. Um, and I think she's also running for office the last I talked to her in her <laughs> county. She's just phenomenal. Um, and she's also a member of the Southeast African American Farmers Organic Network, which is mainly black farmers, but they let Beverly in. And um, there's strong connections with Native American and black folks, especially in the South. And um, so she's a part, she's an organic farmer, and she's a part of this wonderful network. If you haven't heard of staff, um, please do look it up. Um, okay, so I just wanted to kind of give you the bios of the voices you just heard. and. Uh, these are just slices, slivers really, of the work that's being led by these communities that we call food deserts, and the stories and overlooked dynamics that exist there and that are at play in the food justice movement. The hardest part really of putting this whole presentation together is just picking a few of these stories to share with you all because there are so many. Um, but, you know, this book is really about highlighting this work and the resilience of these communities rising up and creating change and recognizing that they're also a part of this larger movement that we're all a part of in this room. But it's also about highlighting the fact that the reason this book and this talk is necessary is to sort of remind people that we're here too. And, um, and, and, and let's talk about these issues um, because the need for it is dire. We need to reflect on these dynamics um, of this good food movement and of those in power over our food system and, and, and this, this movement. Um, and I'm not sure how we're doing on time. I think we might be pushing it. Where's Philip? We're good. Um, so I'll quickly just run through here. I have just a few more. Um, so this isn't just when we're thinking narrowly about food justice, right? Or about what the urban farming movement that has sprouted up. Th this is in low income neighborhoods. Um, you know, this, this is about other issues, and, and we talked about this in the dialogue earlier, about the, how the movement and, and their interaction with the residents are, right? We have a lot of these urban farms that are bringing youth onto the farm, and they're teaching them a little bit about farming, um, but then what's going on, you know? Are we really cultivating leaders? Are we cultivating, cultivating new farmers? And I want to bring Christina Rivera Chapman into the room. She is a, a, food, a farmer and food activist in North Carolina. And uh, she has a lot of experience teaching youth on farms. Um, she's definitely a food educator. Um, but what she has seen in the movement has really uh, given her a bad taste in her mouth. She says, why are you paying staff from outside of the community and asking residents from within that low-income community to work for free? And the youth programs aren't supporting the youth in the ways they really need it. When the youth age out of the educational programs, they are left in the dirt without enough in their toolbox to support all the transformation that needs to happen. They need job skills. They need paying jobs. So, and then, you know, as I mentioned earlier and in my talk on Saturday, what about the face of the movement? How is the picture painted? How does this affect empowerment within the communities that remain invisible or remain painted only in the light of need and poverty? 
where we feel like that's our only role. As Eugene Cook in Atlanta once told me, Eugene is a, another amazing black farmer in Atlanta. He helped start Truly Living Well, which if you haven't heard of that organization, I think they're one of the best examples out there of balancing uh, for-profit farming as well as social programming in the communities to address food access and training, paying our farmers in the black community. Um, but Eugene also has his own company called Jebsite and Grow Where You Are, and he's just a phenomenal farmer. He goes all around and teaches people how to start farms. Um, that being said, he, he once addressed this kind of misrepresentation in the media and the impact that it could have. He said, there was this article in a popular magazine here in Atlanta, and it was a feature on urban farmers. Most of the many black urban farmers here in Atlanta folks that represent the majority of the population in the city were left out. It featured mainly white male farmers. That's just a misrepresentation of what's really going on. Now, that has a rippling impact. Our paid trainees on the farm, they pick up the article, they show it to their families, and they're a little hurt, you know, their hard work wasn't recognized, their pride diminishes a little bit. But then a regular resident in the state of Georgia opens up the magazine and sees a misrepresentation of the, the population, particularly the percent of the population looking for work in this state. So if my son or any other young black man looking for work sees this article, he feels like he can't even consider this line of work or this lifestyle. It must not be for him. So these are just a few little stories. Like I said, I have a hard time knowing when to stop sharing these stories. There's so many out there and I wanna put them out there for you guys. These stories exist across the country, across the movement, even outside of what we call food justice, as I keep saying. These stories of disparity and representation and who is receiving the beneficial results of the movement, not just to food, but to resources and access to the movement itself. Right, I'm talking about rural farmers and being left out of the agricultural system to get USDA loans and resources and support, losing land, losing access to your water. I was out on the Navajo reservation and these farmers, their water is getting taken from them. Um, you know, the Navajo, the Native American rights and treaties, as we know throughout history, have kept being, um, you know, just, <laughs> trampled right over and ignored. And now uh, the Navajo, they have uh, native rights to the little Colorado River and um, the state of Nevada, as well as the state of Arizona are coming in and just taking that water so they can send it to Vegas and whatnot. Um, and the Navajo and Hopi farmers are, are wondering what they're gonna do. Um, and this is all the way down to farm workers who feel too humili humiliated by their oppressive working conditions and lack access to the system resources to even dream of starting their, their own farm one day. The stories go on and on and on. So I know we've dug into a lot here. We've really dug into a little and a lot, <laughs> right? Just little slivers of a lot of complex issues. And I want to bring us back to refre reflecting on all these complex issues at play. I want us to ask ourselves, what part of the work being done in this movement feels regenerative. Remember the definition. For true renewal, growth, and resilience, this work has got to come from within the community. So how, as a larger movement, can we support that work? <coughs> how can we begin to approach the food movement work in a way that is regenerative? Who is leading the movement? Who has access to resources? Who decides where resources go? Are they in the hands of the communities doing the work? What are all of our roles in this movement and why are we doing the work that we do? Are we aware of the work that's going around all around us? Thank you.